Hi, welcome to the All Things LGBTQ interview show, where we interview LGBTQ guests who are making important contributions to our communities. All Things LGBTQ is taped at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which we recognize as being unceded indigenous land. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Hey everyone, I'm here with Isabel Del Rosa, and um, she is a famous, I would say at this point, a filmmaker. And um, so all things LGBTQ is really happy to have her on the show. How are you, Isabel? Hi, thank you. It's so nice for to, to be here and so nice to get to chat with you and, and share um, news about the film with your community. Oh, I loved your film. I loved your film. It was great. Thank you. Um, and um, so let's talk a little bit about, let's let the audience know a little bit about you. I'm going to read your bio. So we'll have a place to start. Isabel Del Rosal is a Brooklyn-based writer, director, shooter, editor, and narrative docu-style industrial and promotional and has promotional experience who creates dynamic promotional videos for corporations, nonprofits, artists, and entrepreneurs. She has written, directed, and edited a handful of short films, two seasons of sketch comedy web series, Smile for the Camera, and in early 2020, completed her first feature film, Walk With Me, which has won the Spirit Award and Best Actor at Brooklyn Film Festival 2021, Best Emerging Director at Manhattan Film Festival 2021, Best LBGQ Feature at Lady Filmmakers Film Festival, Best Feature at New York International Women's Film Festival, and Best Female Composer at Toronto's International Women's Film Festival. Walk With Me has been nominated for Best English Language Film Best Actor, Best Supporting Actor, and Best Original Screenplay at this year's Madrid International Film Festival, and nominated for Best Feature at Wicked Queer, and Best Emerging Director at St. Louis International Film Festival. So that's really quite a resume. Um, so tell me, did you, you know, when did you decide to be a filmmaker? I mean, did you, were you always really interested in film or did you just wake up one day and say, you know, I don't know, I'm bored and I think maybe I'll try this or so what happened? Um, I guess as a kid, there were no limits in my home, which was lovely. We, we went to the video store and rented VHSs all the time and I was I, I loved horror film mostly, um, but I loved all kind of kind of film, and I still do. I still I love blockbuster films down to the little smallest art film. Um, <clears throat> but it was really, you know, in a senior year of high school where you're supposed to decide what you're going to do with your life and all that. Where I I was like, I have no idea, which most people don't. And and I started to look through the pamphlets, the college admissions pamphlets, and and I kept zeroing in on film and TV and film and TV. And, and then it was just very clear to me. I was always writing as a kid and I was always doodling. Like I had a visual uh, component to, to my, my storytelling. So it just, all of a sudden, yeah, in that process, I was like, I wanna move to New York City and I wanna be a filmmaker. And um, <clears throat> I didn't go to film school. I, I went to a communications program that was very new at NYU at the time that offered very little <laughs> in the way of anything film related. Um, so I just I took a, a crash course summer filmmaking class. And then after that, I, uh, I just picked up a camera. I bought a, a camera from a pig farmer on, on eBay and it was priced well because I think people didn't trust, you know, it was so dirty probably and it was dirty. Um, but uh, but yeah, I just started making making things and that's that's what I've been doing. I love it. It's, it's my passion. It's my happy. Miami place. Then? What's that? Were you in Miami or had you moved by then? I was in New York City. Miami is uh, where is the home base where most of my family lives, but I only lived there as a baby. As a baby, yeah. Yeah, but I've I've, I've gone back my, my yeah. entire life. Yeah, for holidays. And you're and you're based in Brooklyn, as we did here. Yeah. Um, so. So you started out with. Did you start out with the first 
<clears throat> series that you had or did you, you know did you do a lot of experimenting before you came to um doing the series which was um smile for the camera yeah yeah <clears throat> i had made um two short films that it took a long time i mean film it takes a long time but it took a long time to save up the money for each one <clears throat> And uh, and yeah, so I had made two short films and then I became a mother and I took time off. So there was a pause for about like eight years, I think, before I, I really got back to, to filmmaking and, and that came back through um, through comedy. And it was a time in my life where I needed comedy and, and I just started writing and I put the my boys to bed and I would sit up late in the night and giggle and write and I wrote I think like 18 scripts it was like this fury of creativity and I cast uh, our cast and in a way we went we got started and it was a lot of fun so yeah and so what what gave you the idea for this film um I guess you know just like I said I needed comedy in my life when I wrote smile for the camera and, and at the point of walk with me I really just wanted a love story. I wanted, yeah, I'm a big believer in the power of love and in all kinds of love and all the forms of love. Um, and, but I also do believe in the power of romantic love and, you know, and, and, um, and I wanted to tell a story that spoke to that really. And, and it resonated to me. And, and I fell in love with the characters as I was writing. It was the first time in my writing experience where I've cried at my computer writing scenes. I mean, I was so moved and I was so in in each character is how I write. I kind of I'm kind of a method writer, I guess, in a way. Yeah. Um, I, really, I really go into how they're feeling. And so it was a really emotional experience writing the film and elating because it's there's so many, there's so much payoff in this film also. So it's so much to juggle like director. Um, you know, writer. I mean, all of that is really hard. I, I wrote a play once. It was in a. It was a fifteen-minute play, and it was so stressful. Yes. I mean, you know, does somebody interpret? Um, how do they interpret your play? And do you like the way they interpret? At least when you're, you're doing it yourself, you have like this basic idea of what you want and how you want it to be projected. Yeah. To the audience. Um, and, and so that gives a little more control, I would think, which would be uh, really nice uh, to sort of be, you know, in charge of this whole project. Yeah. And, you know, you do your own editing too, right? So, I mean, that's amazing. Yeah, I mean, I really, I loved editing. I'm so particular about the performances, like it's on set. I love working with actors. I, I, it's, it's my favorite thing about filmmaking is, is working with actors and getting the performances just right. And so in post, that's, that's such a strong focus for me. And because I'm already an editor I, and we didn't really have a budget to pay anybody, I jumped in as editor and, and I loved the process because I, I also felt like I would have been over my editor's shoulder, like not that performance, this, and, <laughs> you know, and, and, and I don't like to work like that. I'm a very collaborative worker. And even, even though I edited it, I mean, there were so many eyes on the project and, when people said cut this, you know, you can't, we got to remove this or, you know, I, I'm really, I listen a lot. So it's not so much about control. It's, it's, um, I'm an editor. <laughs> so. I mean, you know, it's your vision. Yeah. You know, yeah. And that's really amazing. Um, and so the music was beautiful in this film. Do you want to tell us about the person, Amanda Walther, who did the music in your film? Yeah, Amanda's um, just this incredible, talented artist um, and she I, I listened to, I discovered her band Dalla um, it's a, her band is Sheila Carabine and Amanda Walther and they're a folk duo in Toronto and I discovered their music right when I was sitting down to write the first draft of this screenplay of Walk With Me and it resonated emotionally like there are so many songs there's a lot of fun songs too and more upbeat songs but I, I kind of played on repeat all the tracks that that I needed emotionally while I was writing and 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 the music helped me emotionally get to the places I needed to get as I was writing the script and when I finished I was so I was so connected to their music by the end of the screenplay that I reached out to Amanda and I sent her the script and uh, and asked if she'd be interested in writing the music and and uh, and she 
connected as a bisexual woman, queer woman, really connected to the story and, and fell in love with it. And it was a resounding yes. <clears throat> and that was back in like 2014. There, there's no money for the, there, it was like, maybe someday question mark yeah. in film. Um, but she was really the first person that, that was brought on to the project and her and Devin who played Amber. Um, but Amanda, I, it was really a different experience for her because first of all, she'd never written music for film. I mean, she's a touring professional musician, but it's different, it's a different world, you know? Right. And then also she needed to write music <clears throat> from the perspective of another human being from Logan. So, cause there's a four songs in the film that are written by Logan, performed by Logan from the, you know, the creative birthing place of this fictitious character. So, so Amanda and I spent a lot of time talking about Logan and her backstory, just as much time as I spent with Bridget Barkin, who plays Logan, talking about the, the, her childhood, her history, all the pains and the aches and the, and the growth and the strength and, you know, all the experiences. Um, and, and so, yeah, so she really found a voice and Bridget will talk about how that was her way into the character of Logan through the music that Amanda had written. And it was like a beautiful segue for her to just like find Logan because Bridget herself is also a singer songwriter. So music is a part of who she is. And so it just spoke the right language and boom, and then Logan was born. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, yeah. and what's that? Sorry. I was just going to say that all, all 16 songs in the film are written by Amanda and then four of them are performed by Bridget, but the soundtrack itself is Amanda's voice and and her brother Adrian uh, Walther produced all the music and, and they sat in a studio and and fine tuned all the music to the film. So there'll be points where they'll, they'll be instrumental and you'll hear that the vocals will stop and dialogue comes in and then the vocals come right back in. So it's it's curated for the film and it's it's so beautiful and so strong. Yeah. And there's a lot of women in here, right? A lot of women worked on this project with you. Yeah. With Amanda. Um, and that must have been very enjoyable. I need to have all these these women in these uh, you know, working roles. Um, yeah, I mean it's unusual in film to have a predominantly female crew. So so yeah. that, was, that was a whole different dynamic. And a lot of people were commenting on, on the energy on set. And, you know, it's, it's having women on, on set, but also people that are natural leaders that, that work really well with people where there was a synergy and a respect and professionalism. There wasn't control and disregard. And, you know, it was really just a, a wonderful crew of people. And we did have a few men on set, our, our camera, our director of photography um, and, and sound were, men and they're lovely and everybody just fit. It's a beautiful team. So if people want to see this film, how would they find you? Uh, well, we are currently in distribution with Gravitas Ventures. And so we right now are on iTunes and Amazon and Vudu and YouTube and all the streaming platforms where you can rent um, films or purchase films. And you could just go to walkwithmemovie.com and all the links for all of the platforms are, are listed there. Okay, well, we'll make sure we put that online so that on the show so that people can see and go to see yeah. the show because it's really fabulous. And all of you people out there need to go and see this movie. Oh, thank um, you. So what is your next project? Do you have one that you're thinking about now? Yeah, I, I started conceptualizing the next script while we were shooting Walk With Me. And, um, and then I wrote it during quarantine. Now I'm just looking for finance but it's called Scene and it's a supernatural drama and it's about a mother and her two children and and like kind of exploring the tether between life and the afterlife it's a subject that I've always been really deeply um curious for lack of a better word about and I've been kind of just exploring that for I don't know the past 30 years of my life so I finally like arrived at a place where I have the skill set to make a, a feature film and I can combine the two things so yes yeah I'm excited and, and have you started the writing and or, yeah the script is finished I'm just looking for financing I'm hoping you know, I have a few leads but um I'm hoping if if we land financing to be filming next fall September of 2023 that's that's the goal so yeah well you must be finding a little 
more access now that you've done and you've gotten so many accolades for this film i'm sure you know people should be knocking your door down to get you to do this so i'm sure you'll get a lot you know um, it'll be fabulous um so is there anything else you'd like to tell the audience before we um uh, well, I guess if you follow us on on our social media, you can see we've been um, scheduling screenings at an art house and in indie um, film theaters, and uh, and so we list all that information, all the current information. If you want to see the film in person, often if they're in the New York City vicinity in New Jersey, Long Island, and somewhat somehow like in a driving distance, um, myself and my actors, the lead actors, um, Bridget and, and and Devin, might be able to come out and do in-person Q and A's. Otherwise, we've been doing virtual Q and Q and A's with audiences and stuff like that. But it's it's been really lovely to be able to share the film where people can gather and and watch it. And it's been a super lovely the whole the whole film has been an incredible experience. So very proud of the entire team and and just very proud of the life it's taken on on its own now. You know, it's very exciting. And you know, the people talk about, I mean, I, I've never experienced it myself, but you know, a lot of people, when they talk about the end of a play or, or a film, that it's like breaking up a family um, when it's over because everybody has been so close for so long. Yeah. And, and that, that may be a little bit of a, of a difficult or, you know, different experience to sort of have this family for so long and then everybody kind of goes their own way again. And, yeah. yeah, it's definitely it's a it's a love affair. It's a it's a summer it's a summer love affair. Um, but you know, I have to say that there there are really beautiful friendships that have been formed that are lifelong. So, you know, like like that that the project ended, but the the connections remain. And and you know, and <clears throat> I would love to work with I would love to work with my entire cast over and over. But you know, casting is very specific. Um, but I, I love to work with my crew also and, and, you know, just wonderful people. So it's great to like people and love people and love what you do and, and, and bring those two things together. It's a, it's a really special experience. It really is. And not, and, you know, not that many people get to experience that in that way. So yeah. you're very blessed. Yeah. Uh, is there anything you'd like to tell our audience before we leave? We'll have your where they can get your movie and watch it. And um, is there any last words you'd like to say to us? Yes, I mean, I just, just a note that the, the soundtrack has been released. So once you see the film, if you love the music, you can just look up Walk With Me on all the places where music is available or Amanda Walther um, and, and you can find it. But also just, you know, I think it's like the messaging at the end of the film. <clears throat> I, I guess it's just really like, and encouragement and and just the idea that know that you're loved and that you can find your place. And I guess that's that's what I'd like to leave everybody with. Thank you so much. And I do encourage everybody to get to see this movie. And thank you for coming on All Things LGBTQ. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for doing this. Monkeypox or what we will be referring to during this interview, MPOX, has all of a sudden taken up a lot of room within the men who have sex with men conversation and community. And All Things LGBTQ reached out to the health and wellness program of the Pride Center of Vermont saying, let's talk about this. Let's talk about what MPOX truly is and men who have sex with men, why should you be paying attention and how can you respond to this? So joining me today from the Health and Wellness Program is Richard from the Pride Center of Vermont and welcome Richard. Hello, hello, how are you doing today? I'm, I'm doing good and you look like you're doing good. I'm doing really good. It's, it's nice outside. It's not too sweltering. Uh, I have AC right here in the library. So <laughs> you, <laughs> you, you've created the environment. So, so let's start a little bit with 
how you came to be at the Pride Center and working within the health and wellness program. Hello. Um, so, <clears throat> hi and hello everyone. My name is Richard Elliott. I am one of the health and wellness coordinators for the Pride Center of Vermont. I've been working at Pride Center for the past two years now, um, I, but I've been a Vermont citizen for the past year in August. Um, I was working down in Jersey, uh, COVID happened, uplifted my job, but luckily I had connections up here, uh, such as the lovely Taylor Small, who is uh, working in the state house. Yes. So one of my first connections up here was Taylor Small, and they knew of the work that I was doing down in Jersey. I was still doing public health. I was still doing education around HIV, STDs, sexual health, all that lovely stuff. And she was like, you need a job? Let me just grab you and bring you up here. So that's how I came up to be in Vermont. And, and thank you for coming to Vermont. And Taylor has always been one of all things favorite interviewees. She's so, a nice one. I love it. <laughs> so let's start by talking about monkeypox and what we're calling mpox. And as you had shared during a conversation yesterday with Dr. Leahy of UVM, um, using mpox versus other language helps remove some of the stigmatization that could be associated with it. So let's start with what is mpox? So mpox, uh, previously known as monkeypox, and what, and what is being known in the clinical and medical field as of right now under the acronym HMPXV, it's a, it's a uh, virus that is akin to, say, smallpox and or measles. Um, it's a human variant that was found in found in monkeys in northern and west Africa. Um, monkeypox has been prevalent in Africa, but it's only recently that it has gotten out into the European and North and Southern American countries. So we only decided to take an interest in this when it had more of a global impact, regardless of what people may have been seeing about the potential for spread based upon all of the usual systemic issues. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm hearing a lot about MPOX. How would I know if I've been infected with MPOX? What what would I have for symptoms? So uh, what we what we usually will tell people to do is like check your body on a regular basis. If you've been to a location where um, there's a high risk population or there is a high prevalence of cases, such as um, currently the top five uh, places in America in the northern United States that are affected by monkeypox would be Georgia, F Florida, um, New York State. Um, what's the what's the other three? Um, Maryland Sarah. and Cal California and Maryland. But if you if you're in from any of those places, if you feel like you've been exposed, check yourself on a regular basis. Um, there's gonna it's gonna mimic what chicken pasta look like. So it would let me actually bring up a let me bring up the example. There it is. So this is an example of what um, monkeypox will look like. Um, you can also see that it comes on many different skin colors, and we're going to be saying at many different uh, gender identities as well. It can look like welts, bruises, uh, marks, rashes, um, le open lesions, open sores, but mo most prevalently it's going to look like polyps that are going to develop on the top of your skin that's going to be filled with a uh, pussy fluid. And we are recommending that people don't try to pop those if they do see them on their body because that can also help spread the infection. And obviously if you're popping a uh, lesion, if you're popping a, um, something on your body that leaves room for more of the infection to get in and spread. Um, this also can look like, this also can be in other areas of the body, not just the mouth, hands, uh, face or legs. It can also be um, on your genitals. So for individuals who have a vagina or a front hole, it can be there. 
And for anyone, it could be on the anus and inside the rectum as well. And it's my understanding that similar to people who may have experienced shingles, yes, that the, the rash and the lesions tend to have a burning sensation and they can actually be quite painful. Right. Think of it, think of it as that as well as some people are saying it's akin to um, having hemorrhoids, especially if especially if it's going to be in the uh, rectum or on the anus. You're going to be feeling that pain, you're going to be feeling that burn sensation. It's going to be feeling very rough and uncomfortable. Are are there symptoms that I might experience before the lesions themselves develop? Yeah. So some of the so some of the um, symptoms that could come up would be uh, fever, headaches, muscle aches, back aches. Um, usually, if you get any type of infection or cold, you can feel your lymph nodes in various places on your body. And if those are swollen, that is another sign as well. Um, uh, fatigue, exhaustion, um, and sometimes people will have uh, anger sores and blisters in their mouth as well. So how long after I might have been exposed and infected are those symptoms likely to appear? So just, just to give a little bit of context, um, prior to the incubation period for um, monkeypox is going to be one to two weeks. So that would be the time period that you should be getting symptoms and or seeing symptoms. Some people may be asymptomatic, which means they are not showing any symptoms whatsoever. But if you are showing symptoms, are you if you are having the rashes, pimple blisters, the headache, fever, fatigue, and all that, you will usually have a sick time between two to four weeks. And if there's anything that's lasting longer than that, uh, we recommend that you go to the emergency room and or see well, once again see your medical provider to see what else is going on with you. Um, you're finding that if you are an, an individual who is immunocompromised and or if you have some kind of um, skin ailment, such as eczema, um, you are a lot more susceptible to getting uh, the monkeypox virus. So we obviously will tell people who are um, under those categories to be a little bit more cautious as well. So how might I be put at risk for or how might I become infected with mpox so with um with infection the highest the uh, highest rate that people are being infected by monkeypox is through skin on skin contact and intimate contact um they we were we were saying as of today actually before this uh before this interview uh we were saying um sex was the the quickest way for individuals to be getting monkeypox which is why um gay men are being toted as the ground zero because there was a lot of uh, sexual contact during um, the breakout in one of the European prides. Um, so skin to skin contact, prolong, prolonged uh, contact with somebody who is positive for monkeypox is the way that people are most likely going to get it. So for example, if you are, say, if you're in a club, if you're in a club dancing, if you're in a club in New York dancing, it's getting hot. People are taking off their people are taking off their shirts. Somebody may be in that. Somebody in that room may have monkeypox. Maybe it's asymptomatic and or may not notice um, any of the symptoms on their body. They could be in that uh, small knit, closed closed air club and be dancing up next to people for hours on end. And with that being that it's um, mainly skin 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 contact they would be passing along the virus without even knowing it. It can be found, we're, we're seeing that it can be found in um, some bodily fluids, but not all. So things such as um, sweat and um, respiratory fluids. So anytime you like cough or sneeze, any fluids that are coming out of uh, your respiratory system, so like your lungs, that can be a, that can be another way that can be transferred. And that's most likely if you're breathing in um, the air as somebody is coughing. Um, it does not like COVID where it can be airborne. It would have to, it's going to either uh, die on contact uh, with a surface after I believe 24 hours or it will 
obviously be come inside somebody's body and that could be another way that it will be transferred. So how it's sounding as though I, if I am somebody who is infected with MPOX, that I am able to transmit the virus to someone else before the lesions appear? Or what is the, the window of time between being infected and being considered infectious? So as you will usually say about um, 14 days, you should know. Okay. Um, that is that, that, is that uh, incubation period. So that incubation period would be um, when the virus is most prevalent in your body. Your antibodies will be built up in, in your body that can be transferred over to somebody else. Um, so we're going to be recommending to individuals to, uh, once again, quarantine, self-quarantine, self-isolate and keep themselves within um, certain circles in order to not spread the virus for that period of time. Um, and once, you've, once you feel like you're out of that, um, that incubation period, that window period, we do recommend you going, going to see your healthcare provider so they can provide you with a MPOX test to see, to one, to see if you were actually exposed to it, if you came up positive and possibly had asymptomatic, if you were asymptomatic, and um, if your body is going to be immune from further monkeypox, further MPOX um, exposure. Okay, I, I'm i gonna move on to seeing my, my provider in treatment in just a second, but some of the early information that was being put out within the public media was about concern for people sharing bedding and or towels now is that because of virus shedding that Correct. i may have come in contact in Correct. that manner okay it can, live, it can live on surfaces so it could be clothes it could be papers it could be pens it could be hard surfaces soft surfaces um it can really live on anything so something that we're asking people to do is uh, regularly clean, just like with COVID, regularly clean your services, regularly uh, disinfect things because you never know um, if you went out and you could have you could have crossed by somebody who may have had you may have monkeypox and it could get on your clothing. Um, we are also recommending that um, any exposure that you're going to be having with individuals keep it to a minimum. Um, no, no, no sharing shirts, no sharing food, no sharing drinks, the typical things we're going to tell you to do while you're ill. So if, if I'm one of those people, men who have sex with men who in the era of HIV and AIDS started adopting a non-penetrative sexual activity for some of my sexual repertoire and sort of holding, cuddling, snuggling during the night. Mm -hmm. MPOX is a situation where that recommendation actually is going to put me at greater risk for transmission of the MPOX virus. Right. So that's going to be because of um, prolonged and elongated contact. Um, if Say if you are in a bed with somebody uh, cuddling and all that, you're also going to be sleeping in the same bed with them. If you may be sleeping with them, you may be sleeping with them for a, a long period of time. Say if we get our usual eight hours of sleep with somebody, that's going to be prolonged skin-to-skin uh, -skin contact and or uh, skin-to-infected uh, surface contact. So that would be a, that's going to be more of a prominent way for you to get the, back, to get the uh, virus through like a uh, very intimate, very prolonged uh, personal contact with people. They, they, thank you, because I, you know, some of the public media focuses so much on sexual transmission and people might have a, a narrow vision of what that does or does not mean. So looking at treatment modalities, if, well, first is, if I'm going to be going to, you know, I'm spending the week in San Francisco because I'm going to Pride events. Is there a vaccine that I could get in advance that might help either prevent or decrease the risk of my becoming infected with MPOX? Well, yes, there is. There is a um, vaccine currently, I can't, I can't pronounce it, J-Y-N-N-E 
OS is a vaccine that's to be given out uh, for individuals who are seeking to be um, to be pre to be prevented to get prevented pre to get preventative <laughs> with monk and pop. Oof, got that. Um, so that this is that pro that prophylactic treatment stuff. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So this this uh this is actually a um a, sh a variant of the smallpox uh, vaccine because the small smallpox and monkeypox are in the same family. Um, this vaccine is readily available in states that are having a high prevalence of cases. So once again, New York, California, Florida, Georgia, um, Maryland, uh. Quebec and Montreal are also on board with uh, giving out vaccines to the public, but currently in Vermont, there are no public vaccines available. Um, previously, like about about 30 minutes ago, I was on a meeting, a meeting with uh, the Vermont Department of Health, as well as other community health organizations, and we were discussing what the rollout of vaccines is going to look like here in Vermont and like when that's going to be implemented. So we're looking at a one to one and a half month um, possible rollout, possible rollout for the vaccinations here in Vermont. Um, currently, we only have 86 doses with uh, 136 more being ordered um, as of Monday, as of Monday, August 1st. And these initial doses are going to be, part of them are going to be, part of them are going to be for um, healthcare workers, healthcare practitioners, uh, clinicians, uh, those those within the field who are having constant contact with individuals who may be at risk of getting monkeypox, they're going to be um, receiving these vaccine the vaccines first. Then we're going to be looking at who's going to be um, who who in the community is going to be more exposed. So those individuals who are in a um, urban metro metropolitan uh, high impact area, such as say like Burlington. Uh, Montpelier and say, for example, where else would be good? St. Albans. I was going to say Rutland. Rutland, Rutland. Um, so we're going to be looking at areas like that first. And we understand that it may look a little iffy to be focusing on uh, the higher population areas first rather than looking at all of Vermont. But we're trying to uh, target where we feel like the virus is going to pop up more. Um, but that kind of leads the conversation to when will the rural areas of Vermont get the uh, vaccination? We're going to be, we're still hashing it out. We're still talking about that. Um, but if we find that there are um, areas where there are more immunocompromised people, um, individuals who are immunocompromised slash um, under the age of eight and or once again, those with skin ailments, um, such as eczema, if we find there is a prevalence in certain uh, pockets, uh, certain populations within Vermont, we're going to be trying to get the vaccine out to those healthcare facilities um, in the rural areas as well. Okay, I, I've got to say that when you were just disclosing the number of doses Vermont is going to receive, that seems incredibly low to me based upon the higher prevalence of men who have sex with population per capita here. And, and I it also precipitated the, okay, if I am preparing to go spend a vacation in what is known to be a high virus concentrated area for MPOX, does that does that put me higher on the list to being eligible for getting a vaccine? Yes. So what we're also saying is that those individuals who are traveling um, to these uh, uh, places where there are higher cases, you would be higher up on the list of receiving vaccination. Okay. Um, but that's you have to discuss with your healthcare provider and or uh, a conversation you would have with the doctor at infectious disease or at an ER. So. You had referenced that the vaccine is similar to that that is given for smallpox, but I'm taking that, I'm making the presumption that the vaccine that I had for smallpox in my youth is not something that's going to protect me from becoming infected with mpox. It's, it's similar in a way uh, it would be able to treat um, treat any um, symptoms that may, that may come from 
uh, and pox virus, but it's mainly going to be used for um, it's mainly going to be used for monkeypox. So those who were vaccinated for smallpox in their youth and or in their adulthood, they're, they still would need to receive this um, new vac new uh, vaccine. So if if I've done my week's vacation and mpox was not something that I thought I was going to be exposed to, and I come back to Vermont and, mm. you know, two weeks later, I start getting the flu-like symptoms and it's like, that looks like a pustule. Mm -hmm. is, is there treatment that can be provided for me at that point in time? Yes. So what's um, being done is called uh, PEP++, plus plus, uh, pre-exposure, pre -exposure, post-exposure prophylaxis uh, for MPOX. It is going to be for individuals who, um, who, uh, who were in a high impact area and are finding out late that they have been exposed to uh, monkeypox. So if they are out of that, um, if they are out of that uh, four to fourteen day window, this will be the time where they would receive uh, this vaccination. Okay, and to be able to access all of that, I would go through my primary health provider, who would then be in contact with our Department of Health about making treatment available. Right. So you mentioned that you were on a call today with the Department of Health. Is this something that to which they are being attentive? So the reasoning for the meeting today is because they have recognized that um, some of the information that they're putting out, it, it, it is generalized, it is encompassing of all of Vermonters, but they are looking to see how um, we can do better, do more for the community, uh, expand expand information, education, and knowledge to the community. Um, they do regularly update their they regularly do update their website um, uh, within like weeks time. I think the last update they did was July twentieth, and that was. Uh, letting us know about the shift in terminology and change shift in ch uh, terminology to ref to uh, destigmatize uh, black and black and brown individuals uh, when it comes to monkeypox. So they're they're staying up to date with all the information they're um, putting out there, but they still want to know what they can do more, which this meeting was um, for. And we're going to be reading meeting regularly. I want to say, um, possibly every month. Uh, just to ensure that uh, the community health organizations are doing what they're able to do and that we are holding the Department of Health responsible for and accountable for the information they're putting out. Okay, that's that sounds like a reasonable and responsible response on the behalf of our Department of Health. So if if I'm hearing you correctly, I would be able to go on to the Vermont Gov Department of Health website and get updates on MPOX. Will right. will the Pride Center also be having either links or updates on your Facebook and website? Correct. I I, I love data. I do. I, I've I've taken the lead on uh, putting all the information out there on behalf of Pride Center and to an extent behalf of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, so I've been regularly putting out information around um, symptoms, uh, prevention, intervention, um, where you can get vaccinated, how to stay safe, uh, what to do if symptoms come up, all that information I've been put out there. And as of today, um, I was working on some infographics that are going to be put out on Monday, just detailing um, all the things that we were that we we're talking about today and all the things you can find online, such as um, where to go, what to do, um, who, the who, what, when, where, why, and how. Um, so I'm regularly putting together information and getting it out to the community and constantly checking um, medical resources, clinical resources, and making sure our data is up to date as well. Well, will the site also include the areas that are experiencing high prevalence of virus so that, you know, as I'm sitting back and looking at, you know, I'm doing a two-week vacation, I'm looking at, you know, either spending it in Montreal or in Halifax, 
Mm-hmm. This is this is a piece of information that can easily be folded into making that final decision of where to go. Yes. Yes. So um so information is gonna be information data is gonna be changing on a daily basis, on a regular basis. So um I do advise to always look at the Department of Health website as well as CDC's um um website and uh state state maps. Um, because we are seeing that we are seeing on a regular basis that um the stats are getting updated. For instance, uh there are only three states right now wherein uh there are no reported monkeypox viruses. So us in Vermont, Wyoming, and Montana are the last three. Um the last time I checked it, there was Utah was on that as well, but as of today, they are not. So we're still looking at other places and the places that we feel like people would be going to, like for vacation, for work and such, and um, watching those numbers as well. And we're going to be updating it, the information as we see fit. I remember back when we were initially doing outreach and the end research was being done on HIV and AIDS mm-hmm. and looking at a cohort occurrence or cohort factor. If I'm becoming, if I am at risk for, and I've been exposed to MPOX, are they seeing any other STIs or conditions that seem to be accompanying that? So that's actually a funny question because I asked asked that yesterday and what's and the response I was expecting is that there are other ST, STDs and STIs that are coming along with um, monkey uh, with mpox infections, and that's merely because individuals who are having sex, they may have not known uh, they have monkeypox. They are individuals who um, do not prefer not to use condoms and such. So gonorrhea, syphilis, and chlamydia are coming in along with uh, mpox. mpox um and pox data so that's what we're seeing but usually there wouldn't be like any usually there wouldn't really be any correlation between the two uh, and the only reason that there is it's because we are some people are toting monkey pox and pox as a sti i i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm still training my mind to like do m pox instead of monkey pox so we're uh, I- I was going to say that this is a learning experience with all of us, the same as post and and pre prophylactic treatment. And okay, so it sounds as though the conversation that I should be having with my healthcare provider if I start developing symptoms should include the, and this is how I may have become exposed or infected. And then looking at logically where those questions would take me so that if it's something that happened during a sexual encounter, okay, what else might I have been exposed to at the same time versus, oh, if you have MPOX, then you should automatically check for. So we, obviously we're going to tell to people, we're going to tell to people if you're at it, if, if, if you're at your healthcare provider, why not get checked for everything under the sun? If you're going yeah. in for much, if you're going in for um, MPOX, there is a, if you're going in for MPOX and you feel like you've uh, contracted MPOX through a sexual encounter or like a very intimate encounter, um, we're going to ask that you get um, tested for SCIs as well. I mean, most likely it, it, it may show up with it may show up with um that infection of monkeypox so we're going once again we're going to we're going to uh we're going to ask individuals to go into the doctor's office say hey i've been exposed to i've been exposed to mpox is there a possibility or and can you test me for um all these other stis so so while i'm there i might as well get the full wealth of your services all right so is there anything about MPOX and response and what the, the men who have sex with men's community or looking at practice versus person for the transmission? Is there any aspect of this that for which people should be aware that we haven't talked about? Um, so what is not being put out there that other people that the community is putting out there is um 
the real of it, the real of having uh, the virus, the real of having the symptoms and uh, being sick and going through it. There are individuals, there are individuals who are um, gay men, queer men that are putting out there on social media and to like news platforms of their experiences. So they're show, they're being very vulnerable and showing off their bodies, showing uh, where the lesions, where the bumps are, um, telling uh, candid stories of what it's like to go about your day have, having go, going about your day having this affliction, having this virus, um, and it's it's been a real it's 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 been uh, nice to see these individuals being a martyr, being a, a pillar in the community, and getting their voices heard because that's the real that's a real way that our the, the health department and the CDC and that other um, health outlets will pretty much listen by these people having their voices out, people being heard and people being loud and aggressive with the information they're putting out. Um, there is an individual out in, in, his name is Dr. Carlton out in San Francisco. He is a, yeah. a queer male uh, GI gastroent gastroenterologist doctor who has been collecting stories from individuals and putting them out on his social media and like being able to watch people's stories and hear what they're going through is um, very, very um, disheartening and um, upsetting, but it's also a much needed thing to do. Um, because what I'm, what I'm noticing from like the health department and from national health outlets is um, it's very, it's obviously gonna be very clinical. It's gonna be obviously very medical and some of the, some of the terminology, some of the language, some of the, Ways that ways that uh, they're describing it is not at a community level. It's not where it's not at a level where individuals can easily understand and imagine what going through this is like. So having these community members that are uh, putting themselves out there being vulnerable has been a huge um, hit and the reason why uh, organizations are taking steps to bettering the information they put out there. The, the more vocal we are, the better advocates we are both for ourselves and for the rest of our communities. And with that, thank you for spending this time with us. Thank mm -hmm. you for the role you were playing in mm -hmm. advocating on behalf of our community. And I'm going to bring you back to talk about risk reduction in a broader context. Awesome. One of my favorites. Thank you for joining us. And until next time, remember, resist.